Java Man and Peking Man are two evolutionist frauds that persist to this day. Java Man is comprised of an ape skull cap, a tooth, and a human femur found over 50 miles away, yet it was pieced together and called a human ancestor. Its discoverer, Eugène Dubois, also found two completely human skulls in the same area and hid them under the floorboards in his home for over 20 years. He admitted just before he died that Java Man was a fraud, yet it is still touted as a human ancestor. Peking Man was a collection of skull fragments allegedly dating to 750,000 years ago. Suspiciously, no other parts were found. Creationists can immediately recognize that these skulls aren't from ape men, but monkeys. The fact that they are all fragmentary is a sign of modern humans eating monkey brains, as many still do in that area. Of course, we'll never know because, suspiciously, they all disappeared in 1941. These two infamous finds show how eagerly scientists will work to cover up the truth about evolution and how bankrupt it really is. I had to investigate. When Darwin published On the Origin of Species in 1859, he deduced that the ancestors of humanity would probably be found in Africa. Based on Carolinus Linnaeus classifying humans as hominidae, or great apes, he reasoned that this ancestor should have originated near the vicinity of where the rest of the species in the hominid family currently live. Alfred Russell Wallace, who, independently from Darwin, also developed the theory of natural selection, determined that, after many trips to Malaysia, humans were more likely to be members of Hylobotidae, or lesser apes, owing to the fact that the human frame was lighter than great apes, and the fact that lesser apes like gibbons can, and do, walk on two feet. Wallace, among others, such as Charles Lyell, felt the human race was more likely to have originated in Southeast Asia. In October 1887, Eugene Dubois began excavating caves in Sumatra looking for the Southeast Asian ancestor of humanity. By 1890, with nothing to show but two modern skulls that had been handed to him from workers in Java, he decided to refocus his search on the island of Java. By August 1891, Dubois and his team had discovered a muller and a skull cap. By comparing the skull cap to that of a modern gibbon, it is easy to see See the morphological similarity to gibbons and disparity from modern humans. One year later, Dubois and his team discovered a femur that he determined to be from the same individual. It was found in the same location on the Trinil River as the cranium and the molar. On this basis, Dubois determined that he had vindicated Wallace as opposed to Darwin. After several incarnations, he eventually named the specimen Pithecanthropus erectus, meaning upright, walking ape man. Contrary to creationist propaganda, in 1892, the same year he discovered Java Man, Dubois published his findings about the two modern skulls in the Journal of Natural History of the Dutch East Indies. So no, he did not keep them secret. Soon after, the scientific consensus seemed to favor the idea that Java Man was an evolutionary offshoot of early humans, but not an ancestor. By the 1920s and 1930s, the consensus began to turn in his favor, but he continued to resent his fellow scientists and died embittered in 1940. Meanwhile, back in 1921, in the Jakutian cave system in what was then called Peking, China, Johann Gunnar Andersen discovered an abundance of quartz crystals that were not native to the area and reasoned that the site would be likely to contain ancient hominid fossils. By 1926, he had discovered two apparently human molars. This allowed anatomist Davidson Black to secure funding from the Rockefeller Foundation for further excavations, and over the next 11 years, he discovered over 200 human fossils from more than 40 individual specimens. This included several nearly complete skull caps. Because of China's strict laws regarding the removal of fossils and antiquities, several casts were made of these fossils by Franz Weidenreich and shared with the American Museum of Natural History and New York and at the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology in China. By 1937, World War II had brought the Japanese army to China. In an attempt to keep the finds from being confiscated by the Japanese army, a decision was made to ship the fossils to an American museum for safekeeping. They were loaded on a train and sent to the American Marine Corps base in Qinhuangdao to be flown to the U.S. After several stops and Japanese checkpoints, the train arrived at Qinhuangdao, but the fossils hadn't. Their whereabouts are unknown to this day. Comparing the casts of Peking Man and the fossils of Java Man led Ernst Mayer to classify both as the same species. Seeing that they had remarkably similar features, as well as some uniquely human traits, he classified them as part of the human lineage by calling them Homo erectus. This, again, would seem to confirm the assertions of Wallace as opposed to Darwin. In the 1960s, even more skull fragments were discovered in Jukudian. Along with archival footage, these findings vindicated the original findings. Over the next few decades after the Jukudian finds, discoveries of several erectus skeletons 
throughout Europe and Asia showed that it wasn't solely a Southeast Asian species. Spanning between the 1950s and the 1980s, African discoveries of Australopithecus, Homo habilis, and Homo ergaster filled in the blanks for scientists to safely conclude the African origins of humanity. These origins were further blended by the discovery of Homo georgicus, which appears to be a midway between Homo habilis and ergaster. The relation between ergaster and erectus is now further blurred as there is now a debate as to whether ergaster and erectus should be recognized as two separate species or two subspecies, dubbed Homo erectus sensu stricto and Homo erectus sensu lato. In 2013, this was further complicated by the discovery of several skulls in Demonisi, which spans several supposed species and ultimately suggests that all species of Homo are really one continuous morphologically diverse species. This will cause some confusion in the future, especially for creationists who have often made the claim that all supposed human ancestors have been classified as either apes or humans. Many of the more primitive species of Homo have been classified by creationists as apes, or human, or both. For scientists, this is not a problem as humans were classified long ago by a creationist, Carolinus Linnaeus, as a species of ape. On the other hand, more confusion may arise as there has always been a scientific debate about exactly where to draw the line between the genuses Australopithecus and Homo. It appears that there is an overabundance of those transitional forms that creationists say don't exist, but that subject will wait until another episode. With these subsequent discoveries, there is no reason to determine that Java Man nor Peking Man were frauds. They were simply two of the first discoveries of an early species of a human. They are distinct from modern humans and having a smaller cranial capacity of 850 to 1100 cubic centimeters. The face is more flat than Australopithecines, yet more protrusive than modern humans. The chin and cheekbones are significantly less prominent than modern humans. The skull cap itself is easily confused with a modern ape as its brow ridges are considerably larger and the forehead is almost non-existent. They were certainly products of tumultuous times, but the mere fact that these discoveries have been repeated throughout Europe and Asia shows that they were, at the very least, genuine and definitely not modern humans. They are another example of how creationism taught me real science. Learn more about the real science behind other creationist arguments by watching other episodes. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may be the subject of a later video. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.